Chapter 17, The Divisions of Faith Arjuna inquired, O Kanaya, what is the situation of those who do not follow the principles of Scripture but worship according to their own imagination? Are they in goodness, in passion, or in ignorance? In the fourth chapter, 39th verse, it is said that a person faithful to a particular type of worship gradually becomes elevated to the stage of knowledge, and attains the highest perfectional stage of peace and prosperity. In the sixteenth chapter, it is concluded that one who does not follow the principles laid down in the scriptures is called an azura, demon, and one who follows the scriptural injunctions faithfully is called a deva, or demigod. Now, if one, with faith, follows some rules which are not mentioned in the scriptural injunctions, what is his position? This doubt of Arjuna's is to be cleared by Kanaya. Are those who create some sort of god by selecting a human being and placing their faith in him worshipping in goodness, passion, or ignorance? Do such persons attain the perfectional stage of life? Is it possible for them to be situated in real knowledge and elevate themselves to the highest perfectional stage? Do those who do not follow the rules and regulations of the scriptures but who have faith in something and worship gods and demigods, and men attain success in their effort? Arjuna is putting these questions to Kanaya. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, according to the modes of nature acquired by the embodied soul, one's faith can be of three kinds, in goodness, in passion, or in ignorance. Now hear about this. Those who know the rules and regulations of the scriptures but out of laziness or indolence give up following these rules and regulations, are governed by the modes of material nature. According to their previous activities in the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance, they acquire a nature which is of a specific quality. The association of the living entity with the different modes of nature has been going on perpetually, since the living entity is in contact with material nature he acquires different types of mentality according to his association with the material modes. But this nature can be changed if one associates with a bona fide spiritual master and abides by his rules and the scriptures. Gradually, one can change his position from ignorance to goodness, or from passion to goodness. The conclusion is that blind faith in a particular mode of nature cannot help a person become elevated to the perfectional stage. One has to consider things carefully, with intelligence, in the association of a bona fide spiritual master. Thus, one can change his position to a higher mode of nature. O son of Bharata, according to one's existence under the various modes of nature, one evolves a particular kind of faith. The living being is said to be of a particular faith according to the modes he has acquired. Everyone has a particular type of faith, regardless of what he is. But his faith is considered good, passionate, or ignorant according to the nature he has acquired. Thus, according to his particular type of faith, one associates with certain persons. Men in the mode of goodness worship the demigods, those in the mode of passion worship the demons, and those in the mode of ignorance worship ghosts and spirits. In this verse, the Supreme Personality of Godhead describes different kinds of worshippers according to their external activities. According to scriptural injunction, only the Supreme Personality of Godhead is worshipable, but those who are not very conversant with or faithful to the scriptural injunctions worship different objects according to their specific situations in the modes of material nature. Those who are situated in goodness generally worship the demigods. The demigods include Brahma, Siva, and others such as Indra, Kandra, and the Sun God. There are various demigods. Those in goodness worship a particular demigod for a particular purpose. Similarly, those who are in the mode of passion worship the demons. We recall that during the Second World War, a man in Calcutta worshipped Hitler because thanks to that war, he had amassed a large amount of wealth by dealing in the black market. Similarly, those in the modes of passion and ignorance generally select a powerful man to be God. They think that anyone can be worshipped as God, and that the same results will be obtained. Now, it is clearly described here that those who are in the mode of passion worship and create such gods, and those who are in the mode of ignorance, in darkness, worship dead spirits. Sometimes people worship at the tomb of some dead man. Sexual service is also considered to be in the mode of darkness. Similarly, in remote villages in India, there are worshippers of ghosts. We have seen that in India, the lower class people sometimes go to the forest, and if they have knowledge that a ghost lives in a tree, they worship that tree and offer sacrifices. These different kinds of worship are not actually God-worship. 
God worship is for persons who are transcendentally situated in pure goodness. In the Kremad Bhagavatam, the 4th of March, 23, it is said, Sattva Vikuda Vosudeva Kabditam, when a man is situated in pure goodness, he worships Vosudeva. The purport is that those who are completely purified of the material modes of nature, and who are transcendentally situated can worship the supreme personality of Godhead. The impersonalists are supposed to be situated in the mode of goodness, and they worship five kinds of demigods. They worship the impersonal Vinu form in the material world, which is known as philosophized Vinu. Vinu is the expansion of the supreme personality of Godhead, but the impersonalists, because they do not ultimately believe in the supreme personality of Godhead, imagine that the Vinu form is just another aspect of the impersonal Brahmin, similarly. They imagine that Lord Brahma is the impersonal form in the material mode of passion. Thus, they sometimes describe five kinds of gods that are worshipable, but because they think that the actual truth is impersonal Brahmin, they dispose of all worshipable objects at the ultimate end. In conclusion, the different qualities of the material modes of nature can be purified through association with persons who are of transcendental nature. Those who undergo severe austerities and penances not recommended in the scriptures, performing them out of pride and egoism, who are impelled by lust and attachment, who are foolish and who torture the material elements of the body as well as the super-soul dwelling within, are to be known as demons. There are persons who manufacture modes of austerity and penance which are not mentioned in the scriptural injunctions. For instance, fasting for some ulterior purpose, such as to promote a purely political end, is not mentioned in the scriptural directions. The scriptures recommend fasting for spiritual advancement, not for some political end or social purpose. Persons who take to such austerities are, according to Bhagavad Gita, certainly demoniac. Their acts are against the scriptural injunctions and are not beneficial for the people in general. Actually, they act out of pride, false ego, lust, and attachment for material enjoyment. By such activities, not only is the combination of material elements of which the body is constructed disturbed, but also the supreme personality of Godhead himself living within the body. Such unauthorized fasting or austerities for some political end are certainly very disturbing to others they are not mentioned in the Vedic literature. A demoniac person may think that he can force his enemy or other parties to comply with his desire by this method, but sometimes one dies by such fasting. These acts are not approved by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he says that those who engage in them are demons. Such demonstrations are insults to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, because they are enacted in disobedience to the Vedic scriptural injunctions. The word asatasur is significant in this connection. Persons of normal mental condition must obey the scriptural injunctions. Those who are not in such a position neglect and disobey the scriptures and manufacture their way of austerities and penances. One should always remember the ultimate end of the demoniac people, as described in the previous chapter. The Lord forces them to take birth in the wombs of demoniac persons. Consequently, they will live by demoniac principles life after life without knowing their relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. If, however, such persons are fortunate enough to be guided by a spiritual master who can direct them to the path of Vedic wisdom, they can get out of this entanglement and ultimately achieve the supreme goal. Even the food each person prefers is of three kinds, according to the three modes of material nature. The same is true of sacrifices, austerities, and charity. Now hear of the distinctions between them. In terms of different situations in the modes of material nature, there are differences in the manner of eating and performing sacrifices, austerities, and charities. They are not all conducted on the same level. Those who can understand analytically what kind of performances are in what modes of material nature are actually wise. Those who consider all kinds of sacrifice or food or charity to be the same cannot discriminate, and they are foolish. There are missionary workers who advocate that one can do whatever he likes and attain perfection. But these foolish guides are not acting according to the direction of the scripture. They are manufacturing ways and misleading the foods dear to those in the mode of goodness increase the duration of life, purify one's existence, and give strength, health, happiness, and satisfaction. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome, and pleasing to the heart. Foods that are too bitter, too sour, salty, hot, pungent, dry, and burning are dear to those in the mode of passion. 
Such foods cause distress, misery, and disease. Food prepared more than three hours before being eaten, food that is tasteless, decomposed, and putrid, and food consisting of remnants and untouchable things are dear to those in the mode of darkness. The purpose of food is to increase the duration of life, purify the mind, and aid bodily strength. This is its only purpose. In the past, great authorities selected those foods that best aid health and increase life's duration, such as milk products, sugar, rice, wheat, fruits, and vegetables. These foods are very dear to those in the mode of goodness. Some other foods, such as baked corn and molasses, while not very palatable in themselves, can be made pleasant when mixed with milk or other foods. They are then in the mode of goodness. All these foods are pure by nature. They are quite distinct from untouchable things like meat and liquor. Fatty foods, as mentioned in the eighth verse, have no connection with animal fat obtained by slaughter. Animal fat is available in the form of milk, which is the most wonderful of all foods. Milk, butter, cheese, and similar products give animal fat in a form which rules out any need for the killing of innocent creatures. It is only through brute mentality that this killing goes on. The civilized method of obtaining needed fat is by milk. Slaughter is the way of subhumans. Protein is amply available through split peas, dal, whole wheat, etc. Foods in the mode of passion, which are bitter, too salty, or too hot or overly mixed with red pepper, cause misery by reducing the mucus in the stomach, leading to disease. Foods in the mode of ignorance or darkness are essentially those that are not fresh. Any food cooked more than three hours before it is eaten, except prasadam, food offered to the Lord, is considered to be in the mode of darkness. Because they are decomposing, such foods give a bad odor which often attracts people in this mode but repulses those in the mode of goodness. Remnants of food may be eaten only when they are part of a meal that was first offered to the Supreme Lord or first eaten by saintly persons, especially the spiritual master. Otherwise, the remnants of food are considered to be in the mode of darkness and they increase infection or disease. Such foodstuffs, although very palatable to persons in the mode of darkness, are neither liked nor even touched by those in the mode of goodness. The best food is the remnants of what is offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Lord says that he accepts preparations of vegetables, flour, and milk when offered with devotion. Patra Panpa Falatoyam Of course, devotion and love are the chief things which the Supreme Personality of Godhead accepts. But it is also mentioned that the prasadam should be prepared in a particular way. Any food prepared by the injunctions of the scripture and offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead can be taken even if prepared long, long ago because such food is transcendental. Therefore, to make food antiseptic, eatable, and palatable for all persons, one should offer food to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. From the beginning of creation, the three words Otat Sat were used to indicate the Supreme Absolute Truth. These three symbolic representations were used by Brahmas while chanting the hymns of the Vedas, and during sacrifices for the satisfaction of the Supreme. It has been explained that penance, sacrifice, charity, and foods are divided into three categories, the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance. But whether first class, second class, or third class, they are all conditioned, contaminated by the material modes of nature. When they are aimed at the Supreme, O Tat Sat, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Eternal, they become means for spiritual elevation. In the scriptural injunctions, such an objective is indicated. These three words, O Tat Sat, particularly indicate the Absolute Truth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the Vedic hymns, the word O is always found. One who acts without following the regulations of the scriptures will not attain the Absolute Truth. He will get some temporary result but not the ultimate end of life. The conclusion is that the performance of charity, sacrifice, and penance must be done in the mode of goodness. Performed in the mode of passion or ignorance, they are certainly inferior in quality. The three words O Tat Sat are uttered in conjunction with the holy name of the Supreme Lord, e.g., O Tad Vio. Whenever a Vedic hymn or the holy name of the Supreme Lord is uttered, O is added. This is the indication of Vedic literature. These three words are taken from Vedic hymns. 
O iti et ad brahmao neda nma 6.8.7 ag veda indicates the first goal. Then tat tvam aci achindogya upaniad indicates the second goal. And sad eva somu chindogya upaniad indicates the third goal. Combined they become O tat Saturday. Formerly when Brahm, the first created living entity, performed sacrifices, he indicated by these three words the supreme personality of Godhead. Therefore the same principle has always been followed by disciplic succession. So this hymn has great significance. Pagavad GTA with Macron recommends, therefore, that any work done should be done for O Tats out, or for the supreme personality of Godhead. When one performs penance, charity, and sacrifice with these three words, he is acting in car consciousness. Car consciousness is a scientific execution of transcendental activities that enable one to return home, back to Godhead. There is no loss of energy in acting in such a transcendental way. Therefore, transcendentalists undertaking performances of sacrifice, charity, and penance in accordance with scriptural regulations begin always with O, to attain the Supreme. O Tad Vyo Paramapada, A.G. Veda, the 22nd of January, 20. The lotus feet of Vayu are the supreme devotional platform. The performance of everything on behalf of the supreme personality of Godhead assures the perfection of all activity. Without desiring fruitive results, one should perform various kinds of sacrifice, penance, and charity with the word Tat. The purpose of such transcendental activities is to get free from material entanglement. To be elevated to the spiritual position, one should not act for any material gain. Acts should be performed for the ultimate gain of being transferred to the spiritual kingdom, back to home, back to Godhead. The absolute truth is the objective of devotional sacrifice, and it is indicated by the word Saturday. The performer of such sacrifice is also called Sat, as are all works of sacrifice, penance, and charity which, true to the absolute nature, are performed to please the Supreme Person, O Son of Partha. The words prakast karmai, or prescribed duties, indicate that there are many activities prescribed in the Vedic literature which are purificatory processes, beginning from the time of conception up to the end of one's life. Such purificatory processes are adopted for the ultimate liberation of the living entity. In all such activities, it is recommended that one vibrate O Tat Saturday. The words Sad BV and Stu BV indicate the transcendental situation. Acting in car consciousness is called sattva, and one who is fully conscious of the activities of car consciousness is called a stu. In the Samad Bhagavatam, the 25th of March, 25, it is said that the transcendental subject matter becomes clear in the association of the devotees. The words used are satprasat. Without good association, one cannot achieve transcendental knowledge. When initiating a person or offering the sacred thread, one vibrates the words O Tat Saturday. Similarly, in all kinds of performance of yajna the object is the supreme, O Tat Saturday. The word Tadarthyam further means offering service to anything that represents the supreme, including such service as cooking and helping in the Lord's temple, or any other kind of work for broadcasting the glories of the Lord. These supreme words O Tat Sat are thus used in many ways to perfect all activities and make everything complete. Anything done as sacrifice, charity, or penance without faith in the Supreme, O Son of Partha, is impermanent. It is called Asat and is useless both in this life and the next. Anything done without the transcendental objective, whether it be sacrifice, charity, or penance, is useless. Therefore, in this verse, it is declared that such activities are abominable. Everything should be done for the Supreme in car consciousness. Without such faith, and without the proper guidance, there can never be any fruit. In all the Vedic scriptures, faith in the Supreme is advised. In the pursuit of all Vedic instructions, the ultimate goal is the understanding of car. No one can obtain success without following this principle. Therefore, the best course is to work from the very beginning in car consciousness under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. That is the way to make everything successful. In the conditional state, people are attracted to worshipping demigods, ghosts, or yaknas like Kuvera. The mode of goodness is better than the modes of passion and ignorance, but one who takes directly to car consciousness is transcendental to all three modes of material nature.
Although there is a process of gradual elevation, if one, by the association of pure devotees, takes directly to car consciousness, that is the best way. And that is recommended in this chapter. To achieve success in this way, one must first find the proper spiritual master and receive training under his direction. Then one can achieve faith in the Supreme. When that faith matures, in the course of time, it is called love of God. This love is the ultimate goal of the living entities. One should therefore take to car consciousness directly. That is the message of this 17th chapter.